1934, a palatial Spanish-style home stood at the top of Tower Grove Road in Beverly Hills. Sequestered within was the man who built the house, and he was now a figure of ridicule. He had become the image of failure, and local people lined up to laugh at him. It would be easy to imagine that this was some aging icon who had not moved with the times, but the man in the house was barely in his mid-thirties. Just five years previously, he had been one of the biggest stars in the world. He was considered one of the most beautiful men to have ever lived, and was famous for his intense erotic scenes with Greta Garbo, both on screen and in real life. And yet, he was reduced to nothing, a shell of a man in a crumbling home, surrounded by the paraphernalia of a tormented alcoholic. Finally, the greatest lover was discovered drowning in his own sumptuous pool, his heart crushed by Hollywood. Stories of a terrible vendetta began to emerge, but there was so much more to John Gilbert and the story of his descent into becoming the so-called dark star of Hollywood. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. <laughs> John Gilbert was born with few family advantages in 1897 in a modest boarding house in Logan, Utah. His parents, John George Pringle and Ida Adair Apperly Gilbert, were actors in a traveling theater company. His mother, a lesser-known actress, had left her acting troupe to have him, a child she did not want. His childhood was filled with abuse and neglect. The family moved often as his parents chased acting opportunities. This led to young Jack attending various schools across the country. When they finally settled in California, he went to Hitchcock Military Academy in San Rafael. His father was absent, and his impulsive mother openly regretted having him. His situation worsened when, at 14, his mother died, leaving him completely isolated. Leaving school behind, Gilbert worked as a rubber goods salesman in San Francisco before joining the Baker Stock Company in Portland, Oregon in 1914. He briefly managed a stage the next year in Spokane, Washington, but lost the job when the company folded. Out of desperation, John Pringle reinvented himself as Jack Gilbert and headed to Hollywood to make his mark. Thanks to his good looks, he quickly found roles as a film extra through Herschel Mayall. His film debut came with The Mother Instinct in 1915, directed by Wilfred Lucas. He also worked as an extra in several other films between 1915 and 1916, such as The Coward, Aloha Oi, Civilization, The Last Act, and William Hart's Hell's Hinges. His breakout role came in 1917 with Princess of the Dark, a tragic romance where Gilbert portrayed a hunchback in love with a blind girl. His handsomeness and charisma soon won him public attention. While working behind the scenes on movie sets, Gilbert met Olivia Burwell from Mississippi and fell in love with her. Gilbert married Burwell in a swift ceremony in August 1918. However, the income he made from Hollywood was insufficient to sustain both of them, and this forced Gilbert to send his wife back to her hometown with a promise to reunite once he achieved success. Unfortunately, this reunion never materialized. Several film experts regard The Great Redeemer, which was released in October 1920 with stars House Peters and Marjorie Daw, as the film that shifted Gilbert's career from behind-the-scenes work to acting. However, contemporary reviews do not credit him as an actor in this film, but do acknowledge his role in adapting the story with Jules Firthman. Meanwhile, two films from 1919 also showed him, The Busher featuring Charles Ray and Colleen Moore, and The Heart of the Hills starring Mary Pickford. In The Busher, he played the minor role of a well-dressed banker's son, who sees himself as the top socialite of his town, chosen for his looks and his ability to project wealth through his attire. However, it was the Heart of the Hills that provided him a major opportunity. Gilbert's performance in The Heart of the Hills showed his potential before he became famous. His reputation expanded and he was thought of as a potential writer. Consequently, in 1920, Maurice Tourneur signed him to a dual-role contract for writing and acting. That year, Gilbert contributed to The White Circle and The Great Redeemer, and in 1921, to Deep Waters. Solely as a writer, he worked on The Bait, which starred Hope Hampton, for whom he also wrote and directed Love's Penalty. In 1921, Gilbert entered a three-year deal with Fox Film Corporation. 
Fox insisted he switch his lighthearted Jack back to the more intense John to better suit dramatic roles. This change was successful and Gilbert soon won several leading roles in romantic films, starting with Shame and followed by others like Arabian Love, The Yellow Stain, Monte Cristo, and A California Romance. Gilbert was now obliged to honor a commitment to his estranged wife, Olivia Burwell. However, he became romantically involved with actress Leatrice Joy. In February 1921, Gilbert declared his engagement to Joy, and they were married in Tijuana by November of the same year, all of which was a shock to Olivia. Due to Gilbert not having divorced his first wife, the legality of this marriage in Mexico was dubious, leading to its annulment to Dog Jenny scandal. He and Leatrice married on March 3, 1922. Their marriage was stormy. In June 1923, Joy gained a legal separation, accusing Gilbert of hitting her in the face following an evening of drinking. Gilbert had intense jealousy over Joy's popularity and higher earnings. They made up after a few months, but in August 1924, Joy, expecting their child, filed for divorce. She later said the relationship ended after discovering Gilbert's affair with Lorette Taylor. Joy also accused him of relationships with Barbara Lamar, Lila Lee, and B.B. Daniels. The couple had a daughter, Leatrice Gilbert Fountain, born on September 4, 1924. Joy obtained a divorce in May 1925, and like his own father, Gilbert played little part in his daughter's upbringing. Gilbert's career took a positive turn with the 1923 John Ford movie, Cameo Kirby. In this film, he played a flamboyant riverboat gambler, jangling with cameo jewelry. He wore a white ruffled shirt, snug light trousers, tall boots, a black hat and jacket, and dramatically handled a full black cape. Though his role was more about style than substance, Gilbert carried it off with considerable charisma. The plot was typical melodrama, yet under Ford's skilled direction and Gilbert's performance, it succeeded. It was King Vidor, however, who propelled Gilbert's stardom further. Gilbert switched to the newly formed MGM Studios, raising his status once more under the guidance of producer Irving Thalberg. In 1924, John Gilbert starred in two big MGM films, one directed by King Vidor, His Hour, and another by Victor Seastrom, He Who Gets Slapped, both of which played major roles in cementing his stardom. His Hour featured Gilbert as a charismatic Russian prince. He pranced through ornate settings where he awaited opportunities to woo his co-star, Eileen Pringle. Gilbert's movement and style was similar to the flair of Valentino, who was his primary competitor for female adoration. The plot by romance novelist Eleanor Glynn revolved around a typical Glynn scenario where demure women encounter wild aristocratic men, always of European descent, as it was believed that such bold behavior was uncharacteristic of American men. In one scene, Gilbert kisses Eileen while she pretends to sleep and this culminates in a dramatic moment where she threatens to shoot herself if he touches her again. He Who Gets Slapped was a real contrast, with Gilbert taking a backseat in a film designed as a vehicle for Lon Chaney. Gilbert playing Bizzano, a circus stunt writer, falls for Norma Shearer's character. This role endeared him to female audiences, earning him the status of a matinee idol and propelling his career forward. Rounding out 1924, Gilbert appeared in The Snob and Wife of the Centaur. The following year, he starred in two of Hollywood's most acclaimed productions, The Merry Widow, directed by Eric von Stroheim, and The Big Parade by King Vidor. Participating in two such distinguished films in a single year was a rare feat for actors. In The Merry Widow, Gilbert was not the center of attention. The spotlight was on Mae Murray, the film star and the colorful director, Eric von Stroheim. Von Stroheim openly told Gilbert he hadn't wanted him for the film, stating, I do not want you, but I assure you I will do everything in my power to make you comfortable. Gilbert, deeply offended by this admission, stormed off the set, discarded his costume, and retreated to his dressing room in frustration. However, Von Stroheim managed to pacify him with a drink. This led to an apology from Gilbert and a peaceful resolution to their dispute. Murray, known for her distinctive bee-stung lips, was perfectly cast as the ideal 1920s heroine. 
She was supported by Gilbert as the romantic lead, Roy Darcy as the archetypal villain, and Tully Marshall in one of his most memorable roles as a foot fetishist. The film was treated as a high-end production, with ticket prices set at $5 for matinees, and even higher for evening shows. Von Stroheim's direction included a remarkable scene depicting how each of Murray's suitors viewed her differently. Gilbert as the romantic saw only her face, Darcy the seducer focused on her body, and Marshall the fetishist noticed only her small feet and dainty shoes. Gilbert was astonished by the public's reaction to his rising fame, noting, Everywhere I hear whispers and gasps in acknowledgement of my presence. The whole thing became too fantastic for me to comprehend. Acting, the very thing I had been fighting and ridiculing for seven years, had brought me success, riches, and renown. I was a great motion picture artist. Well, I'll be damned. While The Merry Widow featured Gilbert within a talented ensemble directed by a visionary, his next film placed him squarely in the spotlight. Every major movie star's career has a defining moment, and for Gilbert it was The Big Parade. Directed by King Vidor and based on a story by Lawrence Stallings, this war film was made in collaboration with the 2nd Division of the U.S. Army and Air Services units at Kelly Field. The Big Parade stands as a classic, retaining its impact as powerfully as when it first debuted shortly after the war it portrayed. When John Gilbert was proposed as the lead, Vidor hesitated. Having directed Gilbert in two romantic dramas already, Vidor did not envision a matinee idol for this gritty role. He respected Gilbert, but doubted his fit for a character that should resemble a battle-weary soldier rather than a charming lover. Gilbert, on his part, was hesitant about portraying a soldier, complete with dirty fingernails and no makeup. Both men needed convincing, but once filming began, the potential of the project became clear. The early footage was so promising that the film received more funding and was extended. The Big Parade became the hit of 1925, running for a record-breaking 96 weeks at the Astor Theater in New York City. Gilbert was thrilled by the project, stating, No love has ever enthralled me, as did the making of this picture. All that has followed is balderdash. Similar to how Lon Chaney had taught Browning, and Gloria Swanson had Cecil B. DeMille, John Gilbert found a key collaborator in King Vidor, working with him on five silent films that defined his career. This included his hour, and wife of the centaur to introduce him, the big parade to establish his stardom, and La Boheme and Bartoli's The Magnificent to cement it. Gilbert even made a cameo as himself and another Vidor silent, show people. His role in the big parade, one of the greatest war films ever, brought in his career beyond being just a matinee idol or sex symbol. The film is an epic recount of a soldier's life during the war, it follows a young American soldier who experiences love, war, and personal loss, ultimately returning home as a changed man. In the beginning, Gilbert portrays a vibrant young man full of zest. By the end, as his father drives him home from the station, he appears worn and haunted, visibly aged by his experiences. This transformation is not only the result of makeup, it's Gilbert's skill in conveying deep emotional shifts. He went from youthful vigor to an altered state, smoking a cigarette, distracted and aloof from his father during their ride home. One of the most iconic scenes in cinematic history is the farewell sequence where Gilbert's character is summoned to battle and Adore tries to find him to bid farewell. They had earlier separated because Gilbert was promised to another woman back home, but the urgency of war makes them acknowledge their true feelings. Amid the bustling departure, Adore desperately looks for him in the crowded streets of her village, with people and vehicles blurring around her. The scene intensifies as Gilbert spots her, leaps from the truck, and runs to her embrace, declaring, I'm coming back, remember? I'm coming back. Adore clings to his leg as he tries to reboard the transport. Eventually, she can no longer keep pace, collapses on the dusty road, and grasps the dog tags in one of his old boots he throws to her. The scene closes with Adore kneeling alone in the street. Following the success of the big parade, MGM offered Gilbert a four-year contract worth a million dollars, affirming his status as a major box office draw. In his next film, La Boheme, Gilbert's portrayal as the quintessential great lover is center stage. He shines opposite the luminous Lillian Gish as Mimi. 
His performance epitomizes the ultimate 1920s matinee idol. He has a confident pose, hands on hips, always with a dazzling smile. La Boheme displays the full spectrum of Gilbert's acting abilities in silent cinema. It reflects not just his capabilities, but also what the audience desired from him. To begin, he appears youthful, vivacious, and carefree, enjoying life with his male friends. Upon meeting Mimi, he transitions into a man overtaken by profound love, evolving from a playful youth to a fervent lover. This was now John Gilbert, the great lover. This transformation left both women and men in the audience in awe. He was able to arouse an intensity of emotion rarely experienced outside the cinema. By mid-1926, John Gilbert was at the peak of his fame. Only Valentino could match him in popularity among female fans. After Valentino's sudden and tragic death in August, Gilbert became the undisputed leading man of the silver screen. He was a favorite subject of fan magazines, extensively covered, idolized, and followed. He received vast amounts of fan mail, predominantly from adoring women. His next move was to star alongside a rising actress, Greta Garbo. She, of course, would rise to become one of Hollywood's most iconic figures. Their on-screen pairing in Flesh and the Devil was thrilling to fans, and their off-screen romance added an extra layer of excitement. Garbo became his most profound obsession. The director of Flesh and the Devil, Clarence Brown, noted, They were in that blissful state of love which is so like a rosy cloud that they imagined themselves hidden behind it, as well as lost in it. Both stars behave like love-struck teenagers. Garbo nicknamed Gilbert Yaki, while he called her Flicka, which means girl in Swedish. This film was the pinnacle of Gilbert's romantic roles. Its opening credits proudly announced, John Gilbert in Flesh and the Devil with Greta Garbo. It was all about Gilbert in this picture. He was in top physical form, fit, attractive, and glowing in silver. Flesh and the Devil centers on romantic and passionate love between the pair. It depicts a love that dominates a man's entire being. In the film, Gilbert's character, Leo, is mesmerized upon seeing Garbo at a train station. He is struck motionless. It is love at first sight. He follows her, retrieving a bouquet she drops and taking a rose from it. Later at a ball, dressed in his sharp military uniform and holding the rose, he spots Garbo among the dancers. He approaches her and they begin a graceful waltz, almost kissing as she enters his arms. In a secluded garden, their dialogue begins with Leo asking, Who are you? To which she responds, Does it matter? He remarks, You are very beautiful. And she replies, You are very young. Many believe that Gilbert coaxed Garbo into her iconic persona during the making of this film. In fact, he often gave her more guidance in their shared scenes than the director himself. If one were to pick a scene that epitomizes the pure eroticism of silent film romance, it would be this. Garbo places a cigarette between her moist, parted lips, but then transfers it to his mouth. As he attempts to light it, the glow from the match casts a soft light over their stunning features. Garbo then extinguishes the flame, suggesting that blowing out a match is an invitation to kiss. They engage in a deep, tactile kiss that sends shivers through the audience. In today's quasi-pornographic media environment, it's difficult to grasp just how provocative such a scene was, especially at a time when public displays of affection like kissing were taboo. Watching such intimacy in the secluded dark of a cinema was likely intense and thrilling. A title card in the film reads, The tragic, unquestioning, amusing love of youth. No one had ever loved before. Leo was sure of it. This sets the stage for another steamy scene in Garbo's boudoir, which was depicted in many of the film's famous stills. Garbo reclines against pillows in a brocaded silk blouse. Meanwhile, Gilbert, in a loosened and partially unbuttoned uniform tunic, sits on the floor leaning against her. He smokes, with the smoke weaving around them, creating an atmosphere akin to a post-sex daze. As Garbo toys with his hair, he takes her hand, not merely kissing it, but sensuously moving her finger back and forth across his lips. They are indulging in the moment, and he is intent on pleasuring her. 
This portrayal of a man who lives for love and romance, prioritizing it above all else, was the ultimate fantasy of female fans at the time. Regarding their real-life relationship, much remains unclear. It's often suggested that meeting Gilbert prevented Garbo from abandoning her fledgling American career to return to Sweden. In America, she was battling depression and homesickness. According to one story, it was actually Garbo who proposed marriage to him, offering to leave her career behind. Gilbert's response was for her to marry him but continue her career, which Garbo interpreted as a lack of serious commitment. She took it that he only valued her as a professional partner and saw the marriage that way, while she was emotionally involved. Garbo proposing to a man does sound like a very Garbo thing to do, but on the other hand, it seems clear that Gilbert was as much, if not more, emotionally involved. What happened next certainly supports the theory that Gilbert was the driving force in their love affair. In 1926, when King Vidor planned to marry actress Eleanor Boardman, Gilbert suggested that they have a double wedding with him and Garbo. On the wedding day, however, Garbo jilted him, leaving Gilbert distraught. At one point, he was found crying in the bathroom. It was there that Louis B. Mayer encountered him and said, Sleep with her. Don't marry her. Reacting impulsively, Gilbert punched Mayer, knocking him to the ground and shattering his glasses. Mayer, sprawling, then threatened, I will destroy you. Gilbert had easily overpowered him physically, but Mayer's words were not empty threats, and this powerful man had the means to follow through on them. Gilbert's following films in 1927, the show, 12 Miles Out, and Man, Woman, and Sin, featured him alongside other major co-stars and high-quality productions. In the show, directed by Todd Browning and reuniting him with René Adoré from The Big Parade, he played a carnival barker. Despite Variety's prediction that this role would diminish his appeal to female fans because it lacked romance, he proved popular as a charming rogue. 12 Miles Out was well received, pairing him with Joan Crawford, whose breakout performance was highly praised. Variety noted that a couple more films of such caliber would secure her status as a big star, and they were right. The film A Tale of Modern Pirates allowed Gilbert to show off a mix of comedy, action, and romance. Man, Woman, and Sin featured John Gilbert alongside the stage actress Jean Eagles. Eagles, who struggled with addiction, was looking worn and prematurely aged. With concerns about her declining appearance, the film cleverly shifted the typical roles. Gilbert plays a naive and innocent young man who is seduced by Eagles' character. After succumbing to her charms, he transforms into the typical Gilbert, an intense and passionate lover, drawing the audience's focus from her to him. Gilbert's major film of 1927, Love, released almost at the same time as Man, Woman, and Sin in December, drew immediate attention. Once again, he was paired with Garbo. This release was timed perfectly with the peak of the public's interest in Gilbert and Garbo's real-life romance, albeit just as Garbo's interest in him was waning. MGM leveraged this in the film, which was an adaptation of Anna Karenina. Love was directed by Edmund Goulding and adapted by Francis Marion. This film is often mocked for the severe liberties it took with the original story, while European versions of the film remain true to the novel, with Anna meeting her tragic end under the train. The American version offers a more positive conclusion. In this ending, Karenin has passed away, Anna's son is thriving at military school, Vronsky rejoins his regiment, and Anna, stylishly dressed, is joyously reunited with her lover. All a big, happy Hollywood ending to this vast Russian tragedy. Tolstoy would surely have been turning in his grave. That said, Love is a film that knows its purpose as a movie adaptation. It simplifies the story. The film strips away subplots, politics, and moral lessons, reducing the complexity and pain to focus on the romance. It provides audiences with plenty of beautifully lit close-ups of Greta Garbo and John Gilbert, both impeccably dressed. This is precisely what audiences craved, a story rich in love, featuring two stars who appeared to be in love, both on and off the screen. Love showed why Gilbert was such a star. Gilbert possessed a male equivalent to Garbo's beauty and grace, and an ability to fully embody romance. 
Importantly, he appeared genuinely invested in his roles, happily wearing his military uniforms without a hint of irony or self-mockery. Unlike Valentino and John Barrymore, Gilbert never broke the romantic illusion with a knowing wink to the audience. His authentic passion, coupled with the public's knowledge of his real-life romance with Garbo, made the film a huge hit. Variety's review went, Love plus Gilbert plus Garbo is a clarion call to shoppers. Shoppers mean women, and women mean matinees, big ones. Try and keep the femmes away from this one. The girls are going to pay off this production cost and some more besides. This is probably not the kind of cynical review you'd find in most film magazines today, quite frankly. People were willing to crowd in to cramp theaters practically on top of each other for two hours just to catch a glimpse. Garbo and Gilbert were the ideal cinematic couple, but by late 1928, when MGM cast them together again, their real-life romance had definitively ended. The overlap between their real-life interactions and their on-screen roles led some to speculate that their relationship was a fabrication. Some claim it was all staged to boost their films and to conceal Garbo's bisexuality. The various rumors surrounding their romance have fueled its legend. This only increased the mystique and aura around Garbo, but had, in the end, the opposite effect on Gilbert. Perhaps audiences were disappointed that the mighty Gilbert had failed to tame the Swedish Sphinx. Released in early 1929, A Woman of Affairs adapted from Michael R. Lenz's popular novel The Green Hat delivered the high production values typical of MGM. The film featured stylish costumes by Adrian, set designs by Cedric Gibbons, and cinematography by William Daniels. Gilbert and Garbo are seen in expansive Art Deco settings, wearing fabulous hats and elegant attire, with Gilbert looking especially sharp in a 1920s tuxedo. However, the film focuses more on Garbo this time, with Gilbert's role allowing him only brief moments to stand out. The end of the relationship devastated Gilbert. He continued his wild life of parties, but now the drinking was the main event, and he was slipping into severe alcoholism. He was traumatized by having two parents who didn't care for him at all, and every further loss hurt him doubly, it seems. In early May 1929, critiques of John Gilbert's last silent film, Desert Nights, were published. A prominent headline for the film declared, No Dialogue, and the review emphasized, Without benefit of dialogue, Desert Nights relies heavily on its star and cast. This was not what the audiences wanted to hear. Sound was all the rage, and the art of the silent film was in the process of being buried forever. The movie struggled to be judged on its own merits, the film itself was interesting enough, revolving around a clever plot involving diamond thieves who kidnap mine manager Gilbert to facilitate their getaway. Gilbert rebounded by marrying another celebrity, Ina Clare. On the night before their wedding, Garbo attempted to intervene by calling Gilbert's best man, Harry Eddington, pleading with him to stop what she saw as an ill-fated union. Eddington responded that only Garbo could influence Gilbert's decision. Garbo chose not to intervene to avoid scandal, but the decision haunted her. On the surface, it looked like Gilbert had found a good match. Ina Clare was not just any actress. She was considered Broadway royalty, known for her caustic wit, which Gilbert soon experienced. Broadway was often viewed as more prestigious than Hollywood at that time, and Clare certainly saw herself as more accomplished than Gilbert. Her biting humor was on display when asked what it was like to be married to a real star, to which she retorted, I don't know, why don't you ask Mr. Gilbert? Gilbert's transition to talkies began in the Hollywood Review of 1929. This was a feature where silent film stars reintroduced themselves to the public with singing, dancing, or speaking roles that matched their screen personas. Gilbert, appearing elegant and well-groomed, performed opposite Norma Shearer in a scene from Romeo and Juliet. Despite his lack of formal stage training, he delivered his lines confidently with a clear, albeit light, voice. Oh, blessed night. I am afraid being in night all this is but a dream. Too flattering sweet to be substantial. Juliet! This performance contradicts the persistent myth that his voice was too high-pitched for sound films. 
The segment rendered in early two-strip Technicolor and directed by Lionel Barrymore was quite well received. Reviews from major publications like the New York Times and Variety noted that the sequence was excellent and played seriously. This showed that the audiences were not laughing at him, as was often claimed later. Gilbert was naturally eloquent, yet his true forte was in expressing emotions through physical actions and expressions, such as the way he could convey feeling by simply touching Garbo's hand or by the expressive look in his eyes. With the advent of sound in cinema, acting required different skills. Silent film stars relied heavily on visual appeal and their ability to convey complex emotions non-verbally, and while good looks were sufficient for success in silent films, sound films demanded more versatility. Gilbert's early foray into sound films was decent, if not exceptional. His transition to talkies began with His Glorious Night in 1929, and he continued to work steadily in films like Redemption, Sherry Beebe, West of Broadway, and his final movie, The Captain Hates the Sea, from 1934. Over roughly five years, Gilbert appeared in ten sound films. On the basis of that, his career was far from over. However, the content of his early sound films often felt outdated. This was particularly evident as the industry shifted towards genres that thrive with sound, like gangster films and musicals. By 1930, the public was no longer in the mood for whimsy romance. The world was suddenly a less hopeful place, and was heading through a depression, exploding crime, and the talk of world war. That first film, His Glorious Night, unfortunately did not fare well critically. It was harshly critiqued for feeling outdated, a few more talker productions like this and John Gilbert will be able to change places with Harry Langdon. His prowess at lovemaking, which has held the stenos breathless, takes on a comedy aspect that gets the gum chewers tittering at first, then laughing outright at the very false ring of the couple of dozen I love you phrases. This reaction showed the mismatch between Gilbert's screen persona and the evolving expectations of film audiences in the sound era. The scene in question became legendary, and a classic example of exaggerated movie myth. The image has long been of Gilbert, the unbearable, handsome, brooding, dark-featured, great lover, melodramatically squeaking, I love you, over and over, leaving movie audiences in near hysterical laughter. But it is not really accurate to say it had audiences rolling in the aisles, even if a few did find it unbearably corny. A casual and natural style is essential for successful sound dialogue delivery. This closeness to the audience eliminates the need for exaggerated stage delivery, as subtlety in performance is more effective and feels more genuine. Gilbert received direction to adopt a theatrical, over-precise diction, which didn't translate well to the more intimate sound film medium. In his next film, Redemption, Gilbert portrayed a man who fakes his own death, a story adapted from Tolstoy's drama, The Living Corpse, a title ironically reflective of Gilbert's career trajectory. The film was again not well received, with the New York Times commenting that Gilbert's forced joviality seemed like a cover for his discomfort. It was cruelly noted that audiences wouldn't lament his character's eventual suicide. Downstairs, another of Gilbert's sound films, which he also wrote, cast him as a scheming chauffeur exploiting women, Although his name still topped the bill and he appeared sharp and stylish, his performance lacked the intensity and conviction that characterized his silent film roles. Co-starring with Paul Lucas and the beautiful Virginia Bruce, Gilbert's voice was fine for his character, yet the dynamic presence he once had on screen was diminished. He appeared somewhat weary, occasionally showing dark circles under his eyes, and at times his acting seemed stiff or somewhat uninspired. Gone was the flair and confidence of his silent movie roles. He was competent, but no longer stood out as a unique leading man. The decline of Gilbert's career remains a topic of debate. Several theories have been proposed about his sudden fall from stardom in 1927 to his untimely death in 1936. Of course, there is the victim of sound theory, where his voice either didn't match his screen image or didn't come across well due to the primitive sound recording technology of the time. But another point of contention was the timing of his films. 
the release of the old-fashioned His Glorious Night as his debut talkie over the potentially more successful Redemption could have been a mistake. Redemption ought to have set the ball rolling for him in a way that His Glorious Night never could. Then there was Gilbert's strained relationship with Louis B. Mayer. Many have theorized that Mayer did indeed follow up his threat to destroy Gilbert. Mayer allegedly hindered Gilbert's opportunities in quality sound films and confined him to lower budget projects. After the failure of His Glorious Night, Mayer is said to have kept Gilbert from being loaned out for better films in an attempt to accelerate his professional decline. There are even rumors that Mayer manipulated the sound technicians to unfavorably alter Gilbert's voice in His Glorious Night. Although this is probably even more fiction than fact, Nevertheless, it's noted that MGM, under Mayer's direction, might have played a role in keeping Gilbert anxious about his supposed vocal inadequacies and his performance in speaking roles. Gilbert's personality could have also contributed to his troubles. Even though he was loved by his friends, he was often described as temperamental and challenging to work with, and he struggled with insecurities, a lack of formal education, and severe alcoholism. However, each of these explanations has its counterpoints. Gilbert's voice was adequate. He had roles in sound films, notably at Garbo's insistence in Queen Christina in 1933. Redemption was not necessarily a better film than His Glorious Night, and other actors also recovered from rocky transitions to sound films and personal issues. Regarding his relationship with Mayer, it's important to note that Mayer had a financial interest in Gilbert's films, owning 10% of the profits, while Irving Thalberg owned 5%, suggesting that undermining Gilbert might not have been entirely to Mayer's benefit. This complexity suggests that it may be an oversimplification to attribute Gilbert's career decline solely to Mayer's alleged vendetta. If he could have made money out of Gilbert, he would have, broken glasses notwithstanding. It wasn't in Mayer's financial interest to destroy his stars, and Mayer was unquestionably a man driven by money more than almost anything else. That said, it didn't mean that Louis B. Mayer wasn't actually undermining him. Mayer's strategy seemed to involve keeping Gilbert tied to his contract while preventing any roles that might boost his dwindling career. In 1929, Howard Hawks considered Gilbert for a role in the Dawn Patrol, a World War I talkie. Hawks and Gilbert even scheduled a meeting with Mayer to discuss a possible loan out to Warner Brothers. Such arrangements were typically profitable for the home studio, which would earn from the salary difference paid by the borrowing studio. However, Gilbert's high salary meant there was no profit to be made, and Mayer seemed to entertain the meeting only to raise and dash Gilbert's hopes out of a desire to twist the knife. Mayer's intervention ultimately became unnecessary, as Gilbert's films began to fail financially of their own accord. Because of his high salary, his movies needed to be costly productions, requiring large box office returns to break even. After his glorious night in 1929, none of Gilbert's films earned as much as $700,000. Gilbert was aware and embarrassed by this downturn. Before then, he had been known for driving around town with his convertible top down and greeting fans wherever he could. After this, he started keeping it closed, terrified everyone was laughing at him. His financial strains increased as his wife, Ina Claire, maintained her lavish lifestyle. She decided to spend lavishly on redecorating their house as Gilbert's career faltered. Their marriage deteriorated, ending in a 1931 divorce. During their divorce proceedings in Reno, Claire pointedly paraphrased Garbo's most infamous words. She said about Gilbert, he said he wanted to be left alone. Gilbert's personal life continued to be tumultuous. He briefly dated Lupe Velez, well known for her fiery personality and dramatic episodes with other stars. She had just shot at Gary Cooper. By 1932, he was involved with former co-star Virginia Bruce. They married in his dressing room, but as many predicted, their marriage lasted only two years. With his professional and personal life crumbling, Gilbert doled the pain with alcohol. The drastic shift from his past wealth and fame to his current miseries, coupled with heartbreak from both Garbo and Ina Claire, wrecked his mental and physical health, driving him towards more destructive behaviors. 
In 1934, Gilbert attempted a career revival with The Captain Hates the Sea, a comedy featuring the Three Stooges, where he ironically played a writer battling alcoholism. As he was portraying a character striving for sobriety, Gilbert continued to drink ever more heavily off camera. Gilbert's life continued to decline. He spent his days at home heavily drinking. On March 20th, 1934, he publicly expressed his frustration with MGM through an ad in The Hollywood Reporter, stating, Metro Goldwyn Mayer will neither offer me work nor release me from my contract. Signed, Jack Gilbert. After starring with Garbo and Queen Christina, he was disillusioned to see how the billing had changed in a few short years. Once, he was the headline. Now, he was a footnote to Garbo, and one which she had written in out of pity. He resignedly commented, Oh, what the hell. They liked me once. A man is an ass to squawk about life, especially me. Garbo apparently helped him temporarily reduce his drinking as they worked on this film, but any real recovery was impossible. Gilbert's final years were filled with profound unhappiness. His daughter, Leatrice Fountain, wrote about his suffering from bleeding ulcers and chronic insomnia. In a 1992 article titled Remembering Marlena, Fountain relayed a conversation from director William Dieterle, who 40 years earlier had described Gilbert's tragic state to Marlena Dietrich. Dieterle said, There Gilbert sits in his palazzo on top of the mountain. He still looks wonderful. He's only 35 years old. All the talent's still there. The wit. The intellect. But it's like a spell has been cast. Those last bad years at MGM destroyed something in the center of him. We all used to drink. My god, how we drank. But Jack couldn't stop. He drank till he threw up blood. Till he was totally unconscious. You'd look at that handsome guy with all the parts still together. It was unbelievable what happened to him. Upon learning of Gilbert's plight in 1935, Marlena Dietrich immediately reached out to assist him. They began a brief romance during which Gilbert showed signs of recovery. Dietrich's efforts to boost his career show how respected Gilbert still was, given that major stars like Dietrich and Garbo actively supported him. Curiously, Garbo and Dietrich had a publicly known disdain for each other, rumored to stem from a past romantic entanglement, which might have also spurred Dietrich's involvement with Gilbert. She was instrumental in helping him secure a role in Desire, and encouraged him to quit drinking. But this comeback was not to be. He had turned into his own worst enemy, and self-defeat was about to hit home, very hard. In 1935, Gilbert had a mild heart attack while swimming, leading to his replacement by John Halliday in Desire. He never regained his health and passed away in January 1936 from heart failure. Some speculate that he died of a broken heart, overwhelmed by the dramatic changes in his life and career. Shortly after his death, Dietrich sent a heartfelt message to Gilbert's daughter. I adored your father, Dietrich wrote. Let me adore you. This led to a lifelong friendship between them. After his death, Dietrich even reportedly purchased his satin bedsheets at a high price, a romantic gesture if ever there was one. Gilbert was not impoverished but missed the attention and fame he once enjoyed. New stars like Clark Gable and James Cagney had emerged, and this showed the changing tastes in leading men. Adela Roger St. John said, He grew up with motion pictures and loved them, and belonged to them. He wasn't any New York stage actor who came into Hollywood for money. He didn't look down on Hollywood. He looked up to it. He believed in movies as a great new art that belonged to the people and was closer to them, and gave them more real happiness than the other arts. Ben Hecht had these words about him. There were no enemies in his life. He was as unsnobbish as a happy child. He needed no greatness around him to make him feel distinguished. He drank with carpenters, danced with waitresses, and made love to whores and movie queens alike. He swaggered and posed, but it was never to impress anyone. Gilbert's life reveals the pain and difficulty of living up to the glamorous yet demanding role of a matinee idol. The life of a celebrated actor is not always as enviable as it might appear. It's painful to think of this once bright star sequestered, forgotten, humiliated and alone in a strange modern Hollywood castle, rapidly drinking himself to death. His death shocked people, but not in the profound way Valentino's did. 
In some respects, Gilbert had already been dead to Hollywood for almost 10 years. We hope you enjoyed this look at the life of John Gilbert. Why not check out the benefits of joining our Hollywood Histories membership tier on YouTube or Patreon? Our weekly essays have been discussing everything from Clara Bow's It Girl Cafe to the home of the man who may have killed the Black Dahlia. Otherwise, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your classic movie buff friends and family. Thanks for watching. Sweet dreams. <laughs>